The Exorcist is one of the most renowned and respected horror films ever made. However, most people don't know that the novel the film is based on was inspired by real events. William Peter Blatty based his book on the real-life trauma of a young boy who had been alternately referred to as Roland Doe, Robbie Mannheim, or just simply as R. Born to a Jesuit family living in Cottage City, Maryland, Roland was described by his former classmate and now Dr. Alvin Cage as being quiet, unpopular, and not very athletic, but that he was very studious. When pushed for details on the boy's family, Dr. Cage said that they were a standard, plain family with nothing to hide and nothing peculiar to report. Some reports say that Roland's mother and grandmother were overbearing. Others position his father as being emotionally absent and rarely around. However, every version of this story has one element that never changes, Roland's Aunt Tilly. A spiritualist by nature, Aunt Tilly had always been interested in Ouija boards, the afterlife, and what exists in the great beyond. During the summer of 1948, she reportedly taught young Roland how to properly use a Ouija board. Subsequently, Roland's family began to experience bizarre happenings around their home, such as strange noises, objects moving without being touched, and muffled voices talking. From there, things crescendoed to family members claiming to hear large groups of people walking through the house, as if a battalion of soldiers were marching together. Dr. Cage is the only person outside of the family to have witnessed something during this time frame. He claims to have been spending time with Roland when the chair that Roland was sitting on started to shake and Roland was thrown multiple feet away. The family believed that Aunt Tilly and Roland's Ouija obsession had unlocked something nefarious and otherworldly. They confronted Aunt Tilly, and soon after, she mysteriously passed away. Roland became more and more withdrawn after his beloved aunt's death. The boy's behavior had become increasingly erratic. He would shout and scream without provocation. His family found bruises, scratches, and welts all over his body. The boy's family explored all possible solutions. They took him to see medical professionals and psychiatrists, but to no avail. Eventually, out of desperation, they called upon the Catholic Church. The boy was examined by Father Hughes and Father Bober. During their encounter, it said that the boy could not take his eyes off the Bible. In the eyes of the clergy, this is a telltale sign of possession. Allegedly, during his first meeting with Father Hughes, the boy was asked, What is your name? He responded in Latin, I am Legions. Upon Father Hughes' recommendation, Roland was moved to a hospital near Washington, D.C., which was run by Jesuit priests. Due to the increasing intensity of Roland's outburst, Father Hughes carried out a series of exorcisms that spanned three nights. For his own protection, Roland was strapped to the bed by the hospital nursing staff. But during a fit of rage, he broke free of these restraints and cut Father Hughes' arm open. According to multiple accounts, the gash ran from the priest's wrist all the way to the inside of the elbow. After this injury, Father Hughes took a step back, believing he had made a crucial mistake and that the boy's path to the dark side had been sealed. Roland's family moved him home, hoping that they could find a way to care for the child. However, matters took a turn for the worse when one night his mother discovered the word St. Louis seemingly branded into his skin. The family moved to St. Louis, Louisiana. Fearing social rebuke and out of medical options, the family turned to the church yet again. In St. Louis, Father Bishop and Father Bodern examined the boy and arrived at the conclusion that he was possessed. During his time with Roland, Father Bodern kept meticulous journal entries, which were later published in their entirety by the author Thomas B. Allen in his 1991 book, Possessed, The True Story of an Exorcism. Bodern, who began to doubt his own abilities to drive the demon out of Roland, eventually enlisted the assistance of quite a few priests, including Father Bishop and Father Hallerhan. They would largely assist in physically subduing the boy while Father Bodern performed the rite. Roland purportedly habitually spat at and demeaned the priests, propositioned them for sexual favors, and threatened them with acts of violence. This lasted for nearly three full weeks. One of the assisting priests claimed that the boy had the strength of a fully grown man. After seeing very little progress and an attempt to give his family some peace of mind, the priest decided to move Roland to another hospital. What his family did not know was that Roland was ostensibly being kept in solitary confinement. Things were looking dire, as the priests were having very little success reclaiming the boy's body and soul. As a last-ditch effort, Father Bodern suggested that he attempt to baptize the boy, as that might strengthen his connection to the church. After resisting the priests, eventually Roman was baptized and accepted the communion wafer. Witnesses say that the boy began to speak as if he was the Archangel Michael screaming, Satan, Satan, I am Michael, and I command you to leave this body now. Ultimately, the boy was freed from his affliction and lived the rest of his life in anonymity, reportedly with no memory of what transpired whatsoever. His real identity has never been revealed. Many of the people involved in the case have since mysteriously passed away. However, Father Halloran, one of the few surviving witnesses, lent his perspective on the events during an interview with author Thomas B. Allen. 
Halloran claimed that many of the events sensationalized in the novel and film were not true to real life. He specifically points to the infamous vomit scene and Reagan's eerie change in voice during the possession as being artificial. Halloran does, however, stand by the assertions that there were numerous haunting events that he could not explain. He witnessed a bottle slide from a dresser across the room and felt Roland's bed tremble on multiple occasions. He also confirmed multiple times that Roland's skin was riddled with marks, however, he couldn't distinguish any words. What's most troublesome, though, was Father Halloran felt compelled to burn the infamous diary account created by Father Bishop, leaving only Father Hugh's diary as an unsubstantiated record. This action left many lingering questions that will now never be answered. Roland's terrifying ordeal has been told by multiple witnesses in diverging ways. The truth of the matter will forever be in question. While the priests believe it was certainly a demonic possession, many psychiatrists have viewed it as mental illness. Others believe it was a cry for attention by a grieving and lonely 13-year-old boy. Each group's summation, however, was fueled by its own confirmation bias. So what exactly happened to Roland Doe? It's been almost 70 years since these historic exorcisms, but no new evidence or credible witnesses have come forward to shed new light on this dark tale. Was it a cry for attention, or was it the call of the devil? Perhaps it was both.